Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great Player. My name is Guy and we're going to be looking at a yet another class that I overlooked that you pointed out, the Sorcerer. Now, when they first introduced the idea of the Sorcerer many, many, many years ago, I remember reading the class going, well, well, well. And then I got to that thing which makes the Sorcerer so unique, that wild magic. And I went, oh dear. I'm not a fan of the system that they have employed to make the Sorcerer feel like a different kind of class. Let's be honest, the Sorcerer really is just a wizard, uh, but different, and with wild magic. Which you could argue is the same as a witch being slightly different, or a warlock being slightly different. Warlocks have got a different uh, shtick that has to do with pacts and those kind of things, which makes them more like a pre... Well, you can go watch last week's video if you want to know about warlocks. Sorcerers, on the other hand, are a very strange bunch of people. Now, I had a campaign that ran for almost a year and a half where the one player was a sorcerer, and I thought it was an excellent opportunity for us to explore this class and to understand what makes it that much more usable or friendly than at first I thought the class to be. So when we look at the merits of the sorcerer, we have to be aware that, yes, they have access to magic, and they have a fairly good access to magic insofar as the skills and the class allows for them to be a little bit more versatile than perhaps mages and, and specialists might be. They are a little bit less mechanically constrained than mages. They get different spells back for resting and that kind of thing, and they are different class builds that allow for those spells to be retrieved back even better. They are a lot more flexible in terms of how they use their spells as well. And of course they have wild magic, which adds that interesting twist to the potential chance that every time they cast something of power, that there is going to be a random divergence of magic, and this interesting expression will then happen. Now, it's an interesting benefit, wild magic. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more a little bit later in the show. If we then look at the negatives of the class. We look at that they don't have as much magic as magic users have. So there's a certain limitation. They have a little bit less of a focus. They're not specifically an elementalist or a transmuter or an evoker or a necromancer. They're this separate but similar class. So there's a certain amount of greyness. What exactly does a sorcerer do? I often hear people saying, well, the sorcerer is kind of like a witch. So that's a negative. There's a, not a specific space that the sorcerer will fit into. They're not necessarily as skill-focused or spell-focused as a specialist would be. You might think that that's an advantage. Yes, it is. Of course, it allows you to be more versatile. But at the same time, there is a certain prescription that starts to happen which takes away your ability to make the class just that much more unique. But we have seen before with other classes that that is not necessarily going to mean that the class is an unplayable class. It gives us an opportunity to look for other areas that we can enhance to make it a better overall experience, such as building in the narrative. So again, that's where I think the Sorcerer fits in, is the narrative space. They are a lot more interesting than just a straight cookie cutter mage who's got specialization in one of the different disciplines of magic. So when we look at the potentials of the Sorcerer, we have to look at the potential that there is this discovery of wild magic. And wild magic is this very, very, very unique space. And there are several builds that allow the sorcerer to be able to twist the wild magic so that it becomes a lot more controllable. They can add and enhance their magic at the cost of the DM then being allowed to trigger off wild magic. So that for me, and I know we're looking at potentials, but that for me is a little bit of a negative. It becomes a little bit of a mechanical dice manipulation space that starts to happen, which is okay, but that can drive a very interesting narrative. If you ignore the wild magic table and you create your own. 
So the potential is that there is this wild magic which needs to be explored. And that, as a player, allows you to sit with your GM and say, all right, so we've got this wild magic. I want it to be different from the scholastic arcane stuff that the usual magic users use. I want it to be raw and unfettered. I want it to be a lot more natural in its unnaturalnessness, if that makes any sense whatsoever. So that's a good potential, is to explore that space and to see where that uh, wild magic comes from. It's hinted at in the books and things, but again, that's up to you to explore it and to push it in the directions that uh, make it interesting rather than just a mechanical outcome. The sorcerer class, because of the ability that they have to access spells and as well as uh, to, to fulfill other functions, allows them to become a diplomat or an ambassador. They can see all different points. Their magic allows them to get in and out of situations that a normal class might not be able to do so, but they're not necessarily the heavy magic-using combat mage who decimates an entire army. They are a finesse character, in my opinion, and with the wild magic added on to it, they're a finesse character who needs to be very careful about what they do and how they do it. Because the other potential of the sorcerer is for the sorcerer to become the comedic element in the group. Usually that falls to the role of the bard, or the barbarian who doesn't think things through. But a sorcerer who's wild magic, they just use the random tables that they find and suddenly has feathers growing out of their hair or turns blue or all of that nonsensical stuff that happens. That creates the potential for this character to be the comedic relief. There is nothing wrong with comedic relief. Don't, don't misinterpret my scowling expression. My scowling expression is that those wild magic tables take away agency from the GM and from you, the player. Instead of having a prescription that, oh, feathers grow out of my beard. That can happen multiple times if you roll poorly on the same table and your wild magic is triggering frequently. Feathers growing out of your beard, I'm not entirely sure why that would be an extension of wild magic. This ethereal arcane power is drifting through the universe. You miscast a spell or you pull too much on the ether and you create an undercurrent that acts like a low pressure system flooding the area with magic and you turn blue. If humor is what your intention is, then that's absolutely fine and you can carry on with it. If you're trying to play a more serious campaign, though, that can often, often derail a serious campaign. Everyone is talking and suddenly Gandalf, who's about to say, none shall pass, and suddenly feathers grow out of his ears and he starts to quack like a duck, it really doesn't have the same effect. It really, really doesn't. Now, if Sam, for example, were to cast magic and flowers would float in the air, that's a different story. If you want a good example of comedic effect, it would be Orko from the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, the sorcerer who can create magic and often creates useful magic, but sometimes his spells go awry as well. That, for me, is how you use it as a comedic space. So, again, let's look at this wild magic. I have hinted at it already. If you are using it as an expression of this sloshing around arcane energy, the expression of that energy should be, in my opinion, maybe one of three things. It should be destructive, because again, you look at arcane magic, very seldom is it anything but destructive or constructive. It summons a creature, it mends a door, it creates a wall of stone or force. So it's destructive, it's constructive, or it should be some kind of precognition, some kind of uh, temporal mechanic that gets involved. But generally, those are the three areas that I see magic usually manifesting in. And under construction, you can have armor and all that kind of stuff as well. So if it's one of those three things, that's fantastic. The idea that wild magic is going to create feathers or turn you blue or cause you to do all sorts of weird and silly things is, in my opinion, 
a little bit defeating the point of the class, as well as taking away a seriousness which may or may not be necessary for your game. If I were you, I would sit with your GM and say, can we come up with a much more interesting wild magic system where we talk about those three different categories and we work out how they would manifest. So if the trigger happens, that wild magic suddenly surges, we then roll on a much more interesting table that either brings about destruction, construction, or some kind of temporal event. Now that makes the sorcerer suddenly a lot more of a wild card, which is what I think they were supposed to be in the first place. But it makes it a wild card that's a dangerous one, which means that then you as the player have a much more interesting role. Your use of magic, which can be very, very powerful, should then be tempered with, but what if I trigger wild magic? That creates a very interesting character and a very interesting member in a party to play with, at least in my opinion. So the different types of sorcerer that you get. Well, again, this again boils down to the fact that sorcerers are, to a degree, already a variant of the magic user class. Yes, they've got some things that make them slightly different, but generally speaking, yeah, it's pretty much a wizard, all right, with differences. So the variants that exist then within sorcerer types, as far as I can see, are you get the arcane warriors, the ones that focus on melee combat and enhancing those abilities with magic, arcane tricksters, all those kinds of interesting builds that focus a little bit on the sorcerer's abilities, but also look at the melee combat or the range combat uh, examples. You get the focused masters of death, who basically are builds that can just rain down tremendous amounts of damage in a short space of time and then are spent. And they just have to hope like hell that wild magic doesn't happen. Now, I had the player in my game that ran for, for, for a year and a half. His character, although he made pacts with the god of destruction and all sorts of wonderful things, his character could make spells that just did tremendous tremendous amounts of damage absolutely tremendous amounts of damage which was fantastic it was a specific type of build and then of course the last one is a fast talking roguish like scoundrel who uses their magic more to benefit social situa situations where they distract they obfuscate they d manipulate the environment using the magical abilities to then move forward socially uh, within a political space. So that's an interesting di difference. You've got the combat, magic focus, and of course then the social focus, which really covers the three areas of uh, role-playing anyway. But I don't see very many other variants other than that coming through for the sorcerer, which again is not a problem. It allows the sorcerer to focus on that very interesting card, which is the wild magic. So from a story perspective, of course, then exploring wild magic, looking at how wild magic affects the world, trying to control it better, trying to understand it, that becomes a great story for your character to try and investigate and to try and move forward with, with your GM, where you sit down and you say, I really like how you handle things. Can we do it this way? Because I think it would be more interesting for my character. And if your GM is smart, she'll say or he'll say, that's a great idea, let's do that. And then work with you to develop that. So be open to those kinds of things and hopefully your GM will be as well. They obviously can look at the ideas of exploring those different social areas and of course using magic as an assist rather than as a focus. So from a narrative perspective, they can fit into almost any party because, well, they can be stealthy like a, a thief. They can go into military situations like a warrior or, and they can go into academic situations like a priest or a wizard. So they can fit in very well with any group and not detract from the group's efficacy, which is a good and a very important thing, in my opinion. Oftentimes, when we build characters, we think of the character first and how wonderful the character is going to be, only to realize that you've made a barbarian who's with a bunch of rogues. And that can cause tremendous amounts of conflict until you work out your party dynamic, which is not easy to do. So that's my take on the sorcerer, this very interesting, potentially 
very story motivated class which explores an area this wild magic domain which i don't think has really been explored very much um, at least not in my experience anyway let me know how you explore wild magic in the comments below if you want to see more videos like this, hit the like button. You can always hit the subscribe button. Of course, don't forget on Fridays now, we have For Your Consideration, which comes out and uh, looks at cool stuff that you can do over the weekend, which is always a fun time for those of us who uh, have uh, day jobs to sit back, relax, and play six or seven or eight or nine or 20 hours of role-playing, whatever you do on your weekends. Until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of playing.